All right, so for our second short story, we are going to read The Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, most of you guys know that he is one of my favorite authors. So um, this story is, is a little bit different from the original. Um, whenever you read Edgar Allan Poe in the original format, it is actually very difficult to understand um, due to the time period when he was an author along with um, some of the language that is used. So we're gonna read through just half of it today. Um, this story, the version's not very long at all, um, but I don't wanna pile too much on you guys. So we're gonna read um, part one today. We'll have part two tomorrow. Um, and then I do have a, a short film of it that you guys can watch. And then I want you guys to be thinking about throughout the story, the setting, the characters, and the conflicts. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started with just the first part. The Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe. Fortunato had hurt me a thousand times and I had suffered quietly. But then I learned that he had laughed at my proud name, Montressor, the name of an old and honored family. I promised myself that I would make him pay for this, that I would have revenge. All right, so automatically we have our, our two characters, Fortunato, who seems to be making fun of Montressor, and Montressor says, I am going to have revenge on this. You must not suppose, however, that I spoke of this to anyone. I would make him pay, yes, but I would act only with the greatest care. I must not suffer as a result of taking my revenge. A wrong is not made, made right in that manner, and also the wrong would not be made right unless Fortunato knew that he was paying and knew who was forcing him to pay. I gave Fortunato no cause to doubt me. I continued to smile in his face, and he did not understand that I was now smiling at the thought of what I planned for him at the thought of my revenge. All right, so we have Montressor who already has some kind of plan as to how he's going to get revenge against Fortunato. Fortunato was a strong man, a man to be feared, but he had one great weakness. He liked to drink good wine and indeed he drank much of it. So he knew a lot about fine wines and proudly believed that he was a trained judge of them. I too, knew old wines well, and I bought the best I could find. And wine, I thought, wine would give me my revenge. It was almost dark one evening in the spring when I met Fortunato in the street alone. He spoke to me more warmly than was usual, for already he had drunk more wine than was good for him. I acted pleased to see him, and I shook his hand as if he had been my closest friend. Fortunato, how are you? Montressor, good evening, my friend. My dear Fortunato, I am indeed glad that I have met you. I was just thinking of you, for I have been tasting my new wine. I have bought a full cask of wine, fine, which they tell me is a Montiato. But, all right, so already just look in that sentence, I have bought a full cask of wine, which they tell me is a Montiato. So that goes along right with our title. Okay, so a Montiato is a type of wine, and the cask is what they produce the wine in. Okay. But Amontillado, quite impossible. I know, it does not seem less possible. And I could not find you. I was just going to talk to Lucretia. If anyone understands wine, it is Lucretia. He will tell me. Lucretia? He does not know one wine from another. But they say he knows as much about wines as you know. Ho, oh, come, let us go. Go where? To your vaults, to taste the wine. No, my dear friend, no. I can see that you are not well, and the vaults are cold and wet. I do not care. Let us go. I'm well enough. The cold is nothing, Amontillado. Someone is playing games with you, and Lucretia, ha, Lucretia knows nothing about wines, nothing at all. As he spoke, Fortunato took my arm, and I allowed him to hurry to my great stone palace, where my family, the Montressors, had lived for centuries. There was no one at home. I had told the servants that they must not leave the palace, as I would not return until the following morning, and they must care for the place. This I knew was enough to make it certain that they would all leave as soon as my back was turned. Okay, so he really was thinking out this revenge, okay, so making sure that nobody was going to be around. I took down from their places on the wall two brightly burning lights. I gave one of those to Fortunato and led him to a wide doorway. There we could see the stone steps going down into the darkness. 
Asking him to be careful as he followed, I went down before him, down under the ground, deep under the old walls of my palace. We came finally to the bottom of the steps and stood there a moment together. The earth which formed the floor was cold and hard. We were entering the last resting place of the dead of the Montressor family. Here, too, we kept our finest wines, here in the cool, dark, still air under the ground. All right, so if we were to think about this setting, right? So um, a lot of times in, in, you know, in, in the times of uh, when the story was written, a rich family would have, you know, a palace, so to say, or some kind of castle, but they would have instead of like a basement, right? We would think of like a finished basement. They would have, um, you can almost think of it as a cave under the ground. And a lot of times they really would have, um, you know, they would be potential burial sites, um, or in this case, a last resting place um, for the dead. Um, so that is where uh, Montressor is taking Fortunato because he says to him, well, not only are, you know, the people of my family down there, right, not alive, um, but this is also where we keep our wine here in the cool, dark, still air under the ground. All right, so we're just going to get through two more little paragraphs before we stop for today. Fortunato's step was not true because of the wine he had been drinking. He looked uncertainly around him, trying to see through the thick darkness which pushed in around us. Here, our bright, brightly burning lights seemed, to, seemed weak indeed, but our eyes soon became used to the darkness. We could see the bones of the dead lying in large piles along the walls. The stones of the walls were wet and cold. From the long rows of bottles which were lying on the floor among the bones, I chose one which contained a very good wine. Since I did not have anything to open the bottle with, I struck the stone wall with it and broke off the small end. I offered the bottle to Fortunato. All right, so we are going to stop there for today. We're going to pick up with part two for tomorrow to find out um, a little bit more about this plan that Fortunato has uh, for his revenge or sorry, that um, Montressor has for his revenge against Fortunato. All right, guys, till tomorrow.